reduce what would have probably been a really painful, long, lengthy interaction with the end user trying to figure out what went wrong and then with uh, having to go and figure out how do I get that shim installed on that machine. With just in a few minutes, the end user's still on the call even. I've gotten them up and running. So speaking of PowerShell, PowerShell is great. Uh, how many people use PowerShell in here? So a lot of you are big fans, I know, and more of you probably will be. Scripting can save you a lot of time for those repetitive operations, but one of the shortcomings of PowerShell and scripting in general in Windows up to now has been that you can't integrate it with group policy. And a lot of you are, as you've seen with these uh, demonstrations we've been performing, get a lot of value out of controlling your enterprise with group policy settings. So with PowerShell v2, we've actually finally merged the two so you can script group policy with PowerShell. And I'm going to show you that with another demo that highlights actually some of the manageability of Internet Explorer 8. As Internet Explorer 8 is the most manageable browser out there, I've been told that it's got 1,500 group policy settings you can configure. And IE8 has a bunch of new ones for some of the new features it's got. You might be familiar with in-private mode, which is a really useful mode on a personal level, as well as compat mode. And let's just pretend that I've got in my organization three departments that each have different requirements. Now in the old days, I'd have to create a group policy editor, create group policy Now, I create a script here that has, uh, I create a for each on, needs private mode off, and so on. And the magic is down here with register manlet, which is specifying the registry keys where those group policy settings are stored and pushing that out. And so when I run this, it's going to cre create three group policy objects and link them to the appropriate OUs. It's running the script here. And this will take your, there's, whoop, there's the output. So I've got those settings now. Let me go back into the group policy editor. Objects that I've just created. If I dig into one of them here, let's just verify that I've got the settings that I specified. And sure enough, for the department, in private mode is turned off, and compat mode is also turned off. So it's, uh, uh, compat mode's turned on, standards mode is turned off, as we configured. And so, while that might have been just as quick if I'd actually gone and created the group policy objects, you, you know with scripts like this, with this script, I can reuse it for a whole bunch of different things. I can go to that Excel spreadsheet that we've, where we've got all those thousands of group policy entries for everything in Windows, and if I need to roll out some, uh, create a new group policy object, I can just go and edit this and edit the OU that I'm interested in, and voila, I've just reused this without, and instantly, just in a few minutes, been able to push out a new. So I mentioned application compatibility before and how we're trying to make sure that you can leverage all your investments from Windows. Vista going forward, but there are still probably going to be some, or there might be some applications that just don't work on the newer versions of the operating system, or there might be some websites, line of business websites, that don't, aren't compatible with newer versions of IE. So virtualization is a great tool there to try to bridge that gap and make the transition smoother where you can run those old apps inside of a VM. And you might have heard of XP mode, which is a, a license for Windows XP and Windows Virtual PC 7 which you get with Professional Edition, where you can install the VM on uh, that XP VM, and it's got integration technology so that you can install applications in the VM and they show up on the start menu. And that's really nice because end users then, you don't have to train them about virtualization and remember to go into the XP VM. It's just the apps just show up and they can launch them uh, just from the start menu without having to worry about that. Now, XP mode is great for small organizations where you've got a few one-off VMs that you need to configure. But if you've got, if you're a medium-sized business or larger and you've got departments that have common virtual machine requirements, you need some way to manage those VM deployments. And so we've got something in the Microsoft Desktop Optimization Pack called Microsoft Enterprise Desktop Virtualization. That stuff just rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? And MedV is uh, our vi virtual machine management solution for end user machines. Let me go and show you uh, the, the MedV management console over here. So I've created a workspace, and a workspace is uh, something that describes the settings that are common to virtual machine that I want to push out to multiple systems. 
in the deployment tab, you can see that I've got some really cool configuration options here that let me specify exactly how these VMs are used. For example, I can say what users are actually allowed to use the VM. Here I've said everyone can. If I've got contractors that I give VM out, VMs out to that I want to expire when their contract is up, I can set expiration times. I can also control the flow of data into and out of that VM. So, for example, if there's sensitive data in the VM, I don't want the end user copying it out. I can control that with these settings right here. It's the Applications tab, though, where I specify which applications that are installed in the VM get exposed to the end user on the Start menu. This workspace I've installed Office 2003 into. I've also got a line of business application. You can see this Contoso order entry application. And because I've published them from the VM, they're going to show up in the Start menu under the MedV Applications entry. So an end user just has to know to go look in the Start menu here to find their app. I run this line of business app, and there you can see the telltale signs that it's running from the XPVM, the Teletubby Chrome that you see up here. And you see also this red box that also identifies it as something special. That's a box that MedV puts on there. You can actually go and edit the workspace to get rid of that. The web tab lets you target individual URLs inside the VM. So here I've created medvdemo.com at the VM. And that means that when end users are using their Windows 7 system, they're going to be using IE8, like, I, like I've got up here. When they navigate around to any URL, they're going to stay inside of IE8. But if they happen to go into the site that's pub published from the VM, you can see this is IE6 running in from inside that VM. And so their li your line of business websites are going to just work seamlessly. In fact, they don't even have to remember to leave this to go back out to sites that aren't supposed to be targeted at the VM. Here's a link here that's not part of that URL. If I click on that, I end up actually going back into IE8 for that website to come up. So again, the cool thing about this is that you don't have to tell your end users about virtualization. And if you've ever tried to explain virtualization to a non-computer person, you know that's a bit challenging. They just see this as just regular applications that might look a little bit different. Now, another really cool feature of MDOP that I want to talk about is something called AppV. And I know a lot of you are fans of AppV. That's one of the really big things that people are excited about in MDOP. And by leveraging AppV, which is application virtualization, with, and a couple of other technologies, you can actually realize something that we call part of our optimized desktop initiative. That's, I know that's a marketing term. But there's this thing called uh, we've been talking about called the replaceable PC. And the goal of the replaceable PC is to make it really easy for you to get your users up and running really quickly, even when they happen to maybe lose a laptop. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate for you, because AppV means that you don't have to go and deploy the software to those machines. You can actually have them point up an AppV server, and they're going to get streamed down the application, which looks like it's already been installed, into a virtualized bubble on top of the operating system. So it's a separation of the app from the OS. Then with roaming user profiles and folder redirection, you've separated out the app and user settings from the OS, and you've also separated out the, the data. So now you've separated everything out of the OS. So and most of it's on the server. So now when somebody loses their PC, you can reconstitute those things and get somebody up and running really quickly. I'm going to demonstrate that for you by walking through a little scenario, which is I'm an end user. I'm using my laptop here. I'm mobile. And I spend lots of time configuring things exactly the way I want. So I've moved the taskbar over here. I get the recycle bin I really like down here where it used to be on Windows 95, because I'm used to that. And i also editing my data here on the machine. So I'm going to launch Excel, which is actually going to launch via AppV. I'm going to get a little tooltip down here that tells me that AppV is launching it. So it's Office really isn't installed in the way we know it, or you think it might think of it traditionally on this machine. It's streaming down. And now I'm here that I can run it. So I'm going to make a chart to show that I'm actually editing things. I'm really visual. And there's my chart. And now I'm going to save this and exit out, log off. So here I've just finished doing some work. And I've got a business, trip, uh, business meeting across town. So I hop in a taxi cab, throw my laptop in there with me, go across town. I get up, and guess what? I forget the laptop. It's in the cab. And you know how many laptops are, are lost in taxi cabs every year? Billions are. So it's just an incredible number. And 
So what happens when somebody loses a laptop is you want to get them up